in the uh, few years that I have been here at the church, there has been very, very rare occasions where I have used a video clip. I don't like to, but when it comes to the topic that we're going to cover today, like this immediately comes into my mind, and I just had to. So please, please enjoy this short video clip. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. Marriage, that blessed arrangement, that dream within a dream. Then love, true love, will follow you forever. So treasure your one. Skip to the end. Have you the wind? Man and wife, say man and wife. Man and wife. Man and wife. <laughs> if you don't know the movie, it's The Princess Bride. You should check it out if you've never watched it. It's a fun one. Man and wife, and thus begins a lifetime of marriage. Marriage is a good and a beautiful thing. Marriage is introduced to us in the second chapter of Genesis, before sin has entered the world. And marriage is a topic that is frequent in the Bible. If you go through Scripture, there are many, many examples of marriage as you go through but the Bible is not shy to show us that there are many problems in marriage. See, at, at Genesis 3, when sin enters the world, we see right away that there is conflict in marriage. And all, many, many of the examples that the Bible gives us of the marriages in the Bible aren't great. If you just start thinking through, if you're familiar with the Bible and the stories that are laid out of the patriarchs and others and their marriages, they're, they're kind of a mess. And yet, the Bible gives us help and wisdom and instruction for what a marriage is to look like. And so as we continue our series through the book of Genesis, that's what we get to today is the topic of marriage. And so if you have a Bible, I would love for you to open it up to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 18 and 19, just two verses today. Colossians 3, 3 verses 18 and 19. And as we do each week, would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. This is the word of the Lord. You, you may be seated. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> this was not planned when I laid out this sermon series. Uh, in, in fact, it changed over the, over the weeks and it just so happens that we land on marriage on Mother's Day and the text that I've just read. As a reminder, the book of Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. He's written it to a people that he has never met before, to a people that are in an insignificant town, a location that nobody really cares about, and he's writing to them and he wants and desires them to, to encourage them to be complete in Christ that if they are followers of Jesus, they actually are complete in Christ. And so completeness looks like a reflection in the life that is growing in maturity and that is confident of God's will for them. So that's what he's doing in this letter. And now he gets to this topic of marriage. One of the ways for us to be certain of God's will for us in our lives is by living out his his calling us chosen, holy, and beloved children. And we, as God's holy, chosen, and beloved children, get to live out that identity in all the different spheres of life. So we get to live that out in the home, as we'll see for the next two weeks, and then in the workplace. 
In God's wisdom and through the Apostle Paul's writing, we are given some helpful instructions of what God's will for us is in these areas. And so, this week we'll cover marriage. Next week we'll talk about the relationship of children and parents. And in the last week we'll talk about the workplace. Since we are complete in Christ, if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, we get to grow in maturity, which means we get to live out God's design for us in these different areas. And so for those of us in Christ, it is vitally important to remember and understand God's clear design and commands and expectations of marriage are many, but there are just a few here in this passage. There are roles, there are responsibilities, and there are differences in the marriage relationship that are beautiful. There are so many circumstances in this room this morning that it is impossible for me to address every single one of those. But you'll notice in the two verses that Paul doesn't either. It's really short verses. Right? And so if, if I were to try and address all the different caveats that might come into play with preaching uh, one sermon on marriage, uh, we wouldn't actually talk about marriage. And so while it, I can't say everything this morning, my goal is to lift up the covenant of marriage and for those of us who are married or might one day be married, to listen closely and to lean into what God's Word is declaring to us. And if you aren't married or you don't plan on getting married in the future, there are still helpful truths about marriage that will be applicable for you, particularly that Jesus' love for you is, is exemplified as the most beautiful of relationships that we can see. And also, whether, the, the, whether you're married or not, for those of us who are married, we need brothers and sisters in Christ who are married and who aren't married to remind us of what our commitment is in being married. And so, this morning, the text is telling us, make Jesus Lord of your marriage. Make Jesus Lord of your marriage. So how does that happen? How, how are we to make Jesus Lord of our marriage? Well, Paul gives us two ways to do that, and he addresses each of the parties in the marriage relationship. And he begins with wives. Wives, live your responsibility. That's what he's telling us. Now, to our 21st century ears, these words, these, this verse can sound very offensive. There are a lot of reasons for this, of course, but that, that one word, submit, can be a bit of a, a challenge for us to hear that. But for those in the first century, the first verse is not the stumbling block. The stumbling block for them would be, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, we might think, well, how is, well that's of course. Of course, that's the way it is. But that's not the way it was in the first century. The well-known philosopher Aristotle said this. He spoke of the male head of the house, so the idea of a husband leading is not anything new that Paul is writing, but Aristotle also said that the male is the only possessor of the rational soul, and the male head is to rule over all things. The ancient writings, in ancient writings, the male head of the house is usually the only one who is addressed when talking about how the home is to function. Wives and children aren't normally addressed, but if they are, wives and children are solely told to obey. The man was the only authority in the home and was considered almost like royalty. Wives and children, just obey. No rights. Only do what you are told. So what Paul is writing in the two verses is actually extremely countercultural to what the people would have heard at that time. So what that means is that we cannot say, well, that's just how it was supposed to be in those days. This doesn't apply to 21st century Western culture. God's, God's design for marriage was countercultural in the first century 
just like God's design for marriage is countercultural in the 21st century. Things haven't changed. It's just how we hear them. And what's also interesting, particularly as it relates to verse 19, is that by Paul addressing the husbands and what he commands of them, he is actually radically pro-woman in the household cold, code, which we'll see as we move along. So these two verses very much apply to us today. So ladies first, why live your responsibility and submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord? The word submit there is a command, but notice the command is coming from God's word to us. It's not coming from a husband. The Bible isn't quoting a husband saying, wife, submit to me. It's not what the text says. So this means that the command to submit is one that requires a voluntary choice in obedience to God first. The wife doesn't submit because a husband conquered her or told her to submit. It is a voluntary choice while obeying the Lord first. Women, choose who you can gladly submit to. But just because it is voluntary doesn't mean that it is any less binding. Notice in, in uh, verse 18 is short. So what, Paul, what does Paul mean when he talks about submission? He just says, wives submit to the Lord as is, or wives submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Well, he helps us in other places that he writes. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, we get a picture of what this means for wives. This is what he says. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, uh, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. In addition, he says in 1 Corinthians 11.3, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Here's what we know from other parts of Scripture. Wives are to submit to their own husbands because the husband is the head of the wife, like in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. Since that is the comparison, we understand that in every way the church submits to Jesus as our head, he does not submit to us. We submit to him. And so the text then says, in the same way, wives submit to their husbands. Now, Paul says, in everything. Does the in everything that mean that a wife must do everything that her husband says? No. The wife is compared to the church. The husband is compared to Christ. But men, we are not God. I know some of us act that as if we are, but we are not. So this everything, in everything, means a wife should not submit to her husband in matters that are sinful, harmful, and contrary to God's commands. That's what's helpful about Colossians 3.18 when it says, as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, your first and only complete submission is to the Lordship of Jesus. This is what Paul has said all along in the letter of Colossians. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is Lord. He is focused on Jesus, and the same applies to our churches. Jesus is the focus. And what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 shows us that Jesus is also showing wives what submission is when he submits himself to his Father. Understand the Father and the Son are equal in value and in dignity, but they are different in their roles. Please don't forget, man and woman are equal in value and in dignity. Genesis the very first chapter of the Bible, we see God creating everything. And in Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Husbands are not greater than wives. Wives are not greater than husbands. What Paul is focusing on is the different roles within the household. 
Here's how a friend of mine said it. Wifely submission is something she's called to choose only in those things that do not go against God's word and in no way diminishes the dignity of a woman made in the image of God. And yet these words to submit are not conditioned on the husband loving his wife perfectly. Because wives will probably say amen to the truth that husbands do not love their wives perfectly. And so it's not conditioned, her submission is not conditioned on the husband loving his wife perfectly. It is a response to God's call, a choice to make. Now, with all that explanation, I think it might be natural for us to say, well, then what is submission? What, what, is, it, what is Paul talking about here? Robin and I have had the opportunity for almost 20 years now to do marital counseling with uh, well over 20 couples. And, and we, we spend a session in our premarital counseling talking about the roles within the house, the husband's, wife, the husband's role and the wife's role. And, and when we talk about this, the question inevitably becomes, well, what does this mean? What does this look like? And I'm going to use a few examples or a few uh, statements from uh, Pastor John Piper. He helps us along in understanding five things submission is not and then what it is. So submission does not mean agreeing with everything your husband thinks or says. Husbands aren't perfect. They are sinners. Second, submission does not mean avoiding every effort to change your husband. Third, submission does not mean putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. As seen in the Lord, Jesus is always first. Christ is the only one that we fully surrender to. Submission that a wife gets her personal spiritual strength primarily through her husband. Wives, you, you should be and desiring to be helped along by your husband, but ultimately you are responsible for growing in your walk with Christ. Fifth, submission does not mean that a wife is to act out of fear. A wife should never submit to physical emotional, or spiritual abuse. So, what is submission positively? Submission is the divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. Submission is the divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. And I found this quote helpful from Kathy Keller when she says, If it was not an assault on the dignity and divinity, but rather led to the greater glory of Jesus to submit himself and assume the role of a servant, then how could it possibly injure me to be asked to play out the Jesus role in my marriage? That's helpful, I think, to understand that the Lord has given each partner a role in the marriage relationship. Jesus, Lord of your marriage. Husbands, live your responsibility. Husbands or young or old men who desire to be marriage, married, it's now your turn. So what are you responsible for in marriage? Notice again what the text tells us in Colossians chapter 3. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, we might be bothered by the contrast of, of submission and love, but let's, let's talk about what love the Apostle Paul is bringing up so that we understand and are doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Since this verse is short, we are again helped along by Paul in, first, or in a, Ephesians chapter 5, where he gives a longer explanation and a longer instruction to the husbands in Ephesians chapter 5. He says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. As I mentioned before, this verse is a departure from the first century culture at that time. Love is largely absent from Hellenistic and even Jewish discussion of the marriage relationship. This, this note on the, the husbands to love their wives is a distinctly Christian note, a distinctly Christian mention of love, and it highlights Paul's new focus to that first century of what the marriage relationship is to look like. And because it is new, in Ephesians, Paul gives us a picture so we can understand what the husband's love for his wife is to look like. It says, love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ's love has another in view. That's what his love has. Love is to be defined by the will and action of one who is willing to consider the other as the object of one's concern. Do you hear that, men? Listen again. Love is to be defined by the will and action of one who is willing to consider the other as the object of one's concern. So what this means is that it is a sacrificial, not a selfish love. But that's not all. It is a sacrificial love that is in place to see her flourish. That's to sacrifice so your wife will flourish. So, well, how do women, how 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 do wives most flourish? Wives, you might be sitting here, let, let, me, let me tell you the ways I flourish. Before you, before you say those, let, what does God's word say for a wife to flourish? Ephesians tells us that a husband's sacrificial love is so that the wife will be conformed to Christ. Wives, this is how you will most flourish, by being conformed to the image of Christ. Christ gave himself to sanctify the church, to make her holy. Jesus has loved the point of giving his life for the purpose of presenting his bride holy and blameless and pure. That's why. And then it says in Ephesians 5, 28, in the same way. Men, we get to Give and sacrifice, give and sacrifice, give and sacrifice so that our wives might flourish in Christ. That's the point. Pastor Ben Brophy said this, A husband's authority is for the express purpose of helping our wives love Christ more be more like him, be dependent on him, to be in the word, to pray, to spend time with the saints. All a husband's authority is intended to serve the sanctification, the becoming more holy of his wife. This will mean listening to her. This will mean often deferring to her preferences and not your own desires, working through decisions together, not dictating. This is what this means. Men, our love is to be a servant leader love. Christ-like sacrificial leadership by the husband will keep the ultimate good of your wife in view at all times. So we give all the way to the point of death. Men, that's what we that's what we sign up for. Men, are we, are we willing 
to, to the point of, I will give up my life for my wife. Will we, will we do that? So that she will flourish. Guys will say, baby, I die for you. But don't make me take my week off from hanging out with my guys. And wives rightfully should ask if the love is conditioned, will you even die for me? If there's any buts or, well, not in this case, in living around the home, will we even go to giving of ourselves? Men, our wives want to know daily through our constant giving that we will give everything possible for their ultimate good. And all of this giving comes with the reality that husbands bear the ultimate responsibility for our marriages before God. Men, if you have put your trust in Jesus, one day you're going to stand before the Lord and give an account for your marriage. What will you say? Did we help our wives flourish in Christ? So what else are we told? We're told, do not be harsh with them. It's like God in his word through the apostle Paul knows men or something, right? Why does, he, Paul, why does Paul throw this in? Because it's so easy for us to be harsh as men. The apostle Paul, or the apostle Peter says it a little bit more positively in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Like, that's a big deal. If, if we are not gentle, honoring, if we are harsh with our wives, Peter is saying, your prayers will be hindered. It's like I would say, I don't want to hear it. Treat her right. Don't be harsh with her. Honor her. Man, we can be so impatient and rude, and we see verse 18 in the words, wives submit in Scripture, in scripture and we think, I'm the boss. What I say goes. Man, one of the ways we most love our wives is with our words and with our attitudes. To not be harsh means that we don't speak ill of our wives to them or to others. We don't belittle. We don't passively, aggressively use sarcasm. We don't name call. I mentioned earlier that Rob and I do a number of, of premarital counseling uh, meetings with couples over the years, and we, we use this assessment tool uh, when we first start meeting with them called uh, Prepare and Rich. And it's, it's, a, it's a tool that we use to help us give a, get a snapshot of where the relationship is at before the couple gets married. It, 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 it's a series of statements that are made and both uh, people in the relationship are, need to answer that and on, a, on a scale of one to five uh, or, or a scale of uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then the, it takes the answers from both uh, people in, in the relationship and, and shows where there is similarities and where there's differences. And there is one statement that I always make sure to look at. I mean, I, look, I read through it all, but there's one that I really lean into. And the one statement is this. My partner sometimes makes comments that put me down. I want to know, particularly from the man's side. It goes both ways, but I want to know, particularly from the man's side. Does the wife say agree or strongly agree? My partner sometimes makes comments that put me down. And does she say, 
I agree. I want to know. Because that shows me what the communication is like in that relationship. And it shows me, is there respect and is there honor for one another? Because if, if, if I feel like, if the partner that I'm with, I feel like she's constantly putting me down. If the wife feels like he, he's constantly putting me down, making comments that put me down, we got trouble right from the get-go. In the 19th century, Pastor Charles Simeon said this to men, a proud, haughty, imperious, or domineering carriage or posture towards your wife is most offensive to God, who will regard every harsh, bitter, or contemptuous expression towards her as an abuse of your authority and a violation of his commands. He has not authorized you to be tyrants. Men, listen to that. I'm just wondering, men, has there ever been a time in your marriage where, where putting your wife down, belittling her, has resulted in your marriage getting better? Ever? You, you might get a few laughs from the guys, but that car ride home is going to be really quiet. Harshness in words, in attitudes, or actions has no place with a servant leader. Men, you are to lead, it is true, but you are to lead only for the good of your wife. You seek only and at all times her best interests and to promote to the utmost of your power her real happiness. The verse right before 318 says this, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Pastor Josh preached on that passage last week. And if his interpretation of in the name of the Lord is correct, and I think it is, then we bear witness in our marriages of the relationship of Christ and the church. We, in, in how we live and act in our homes and as a couple outside of our homes, we are bearing witness to the relationship of Jesus to his bride. That's a weighty responsibility. That's serious. Marriage is to be entirely christ Center wives, submit to their own husbands, and in so doing, point to Jesus who submitted to the Father's will. Husbands, when we lead with a servant's heart and sacrifice everything for the flourishing of our wives in Christ, we are pointing to Jesus who gave himself up so that we might be redeemed. Do you see the significance of our marriages? It is not just so I can have a companion for the rest of my life. We are pointing to Jesus. That's the point. We aren't adversaries. We aren't coming together to fight, to get our own ways, to have our things. We're a team. The leadership of Faith Baptist Church desires that our marriages at this church would not just survive, but that they would thrive. The goal isn't at the end of life to, to say, well, I didn't get divorced. And if, you, if you've been divorced, that's not the unpardonable sin. There is forgiveness and there's a lot that goes into that. We don't have time to deal with all of that. That's for another time. But the goal is not just to make it and we, we made it. The goal in, marriages, in Christian marriages is to thrive so that people see Christ and his church. And to that end, over this last year, we have been having a monthly ministry called Grace Marriage. Tim and Tina and Troy and Carolyn, if you guys would come up. Uh, Tim and Tina Hill have been uh, leading this ministry that meets on Wednesday evenings during the school year. Uh, we just wrapped up this last week. 
and, and they're going to share a little bit about the ministry of Grace Marriage, and then Troy and Carolyn are going to share about how they have benefited as a couple because of going through Grace Marriage. And so, if you guys would share. Thank you. Thank you. We did just finish up this last week, and we sure had a good time the, we had last, a lot of fun. the last year. Actually, John's message, I had notes and I started adding more because his message is grace marriage. The me- it's all built on biblical God's word. And I just, everything, I started writing stuff down. It's like I thought <laughs> I knew what I was going to say, but his message really is grace marriage. But we want to thank all of you couples that participated in our first Grace Marriage session, and we look forward to doing another one in the fall. We had so much fun and enjoyed and look forward to each month. We learned a lot about being intentional in our marriage and how to make it a priority. It doesn't matter if you've been married one year or 10 years or 50 years, but you can still benefit from spending time together focusing on your marriage. There's so much going on in our lives and we get so busy, but it's beneficial to stop and focus on this beautiful relationship that God gave us called marriage. Yes. You're going to share some of yeah, the Yeah, some of the we sessions learned. that we had, um, they're just, they're awesome. But uh, one of them was celebrate your marriage with a date night. Make sure that we make that an, uh, important. We're intentional on our marriage. So we, we schedule in date nights. Uh, we all know that we get busy. So that's a, that was a key one. Uh, grace over performance. That was, a, that was a big one. So if he or she does this, then, then I'll love them. Or, and it's just given grace. Uh, we come home, we may have a, a bad day. It's given grace, which led into uh, the red light on the dash session, which means when someone comes home or a spouse and they've had, you take time to listen. You recognize, hey, there's a red light on the dash. She's not, or he's not necessarily upset with me. Something's going on, so let's take the time. Put the cell phone away. Let's listen to them. What's going on? How can I help them? Um, Something's going on. Which also led into the funny one of the cell phone use. Uh, Tina and I failed on this one. Uh, Two nights after our session about cell phones and putting them away and listening to our spouse, we went out for our date night. And as soon as we got there, we put our phones on the table, and it wasn't two minutes, and ding! So we both look at each other, and in five minutes, we both had our cell phones out because our kids were Snapchatting us. So we kind of failed at that one. So it's stuff like that, the sessions that we do each month, and it gives us a month to learn and to recognize when things are, are um, getting in our way. Kids always know the best time to interrupt. Someday. Yes, yes. So, so it's fun. But each month we have a session. You don't have to prepare. You just come. We open the book. We go through the session. And then we really enjoy that we had a month to just work on those sessions, the things that we have learned. Um, so, yeah. So that was the so thing. So we look forward to leading this again in the fall. And you'll hear more from us then about it. And we'll um, have a sign up at that time. But if you would like to participate in the fall we'd love to hear from you and and get your name on the list and we'll talk about um, times that work because I know Wednesday night was a struggle for some so we may offer different dates and and talk more about that in the fall yes thank you I'm Carolyn Jeffrey this is my husband Troy Um, this was something that was on our calendar once a month and it was never something that I um, thought oh man it's already time for this Um, like the weeks get busy and sometimes there was something every night of the week and this was never one of those things that I thought oh man it was something I always looked forward to so this is not drudgery at all this is so fun Um, so keep that in mind Um, one thing that I really liked about it was that um, we've been to marriage conferences before and we've been to uh, other women's conferences men conferences where you feel like you've been drinking out of a fire hose. There's so much, and you go home and you think, well, what am I going to do first? Well, am I going to even do anything? Because there's so much. This is one nugget a month. That's it. You get it. You get it. You get one topic, and you pick a little nugget that you're going to think on, that you're going to lean into for the whole month. And I feel like I've been able to learn more and apply more because it's been bite-sized. Um, and I would agree that regardless of how long you've been married, it would be beneficial. Our kids are in that 
stage of just starting out, and I would recommend it to them. We've been married 26 years, and um, I would sign up again. It's been very helpful to us and very fun. We actually did sign up again. There's a second year available. <laughs> um, I, there really are a lot of positives. It was fun to, there are people in different stages of their marriage, just a few years, us in mid-20s, some maybe a couple decades longer than that, that you get to hear from. Not forcibly, something that I really appreciate is um, during the end, when you've kind of talked about the things with your spouse together, there's a sharing time at the end. And they never said, Troy, what do you think? Or anything like that. It's just it's an open discussion. Many people shared things, some didn't, which is fine. But you're not forced to talk in front of people about your marriage or anything like that. Um, what I benefited from the most was there was always a video of the people that, uh, that put out this ministry. Um, and they would talk about some things. Sometimes then Tim and Tina would add some things from them personally. And then there would be, you'd get your worksheet, workbook out and fill out a couple of things, sometimes about yourself, sometimes about your spouse. Um, but then you'd have 10, 15 minutes to go and just talk uh, about what you filled out with your spouse. And that was always just, I think, the highlight for me. Um, because they're not, they're things that are good for you to talk about, but I know in the last nine months, I wouldn't have brought any of them up. Mm -hmm. um, so we really had good discussions about things that are important to talk about. Um, so would definitely recommend it. It's worth your time commitment. It's worth the money investment that there is. So please consider. Yeah. And always positive. It is never um, one against the other. There's never a time when you feel like, man, he just beat up on me. This session was all beating up on me. The only person that beats up on you is the Lord through his word as he convicts you to be and to live out your um, commitment to marriage to your spouse. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> as I mentioned, we are, we are committed as leadership to continue to have this ministry, Grace Marriage. Uh, the, I, I could say a lot. Robin and I hugely were blessed by this ministry and Tim and Tina leading it. Uh, and, and we as a leadership will do everything we possibly can to make sure that any couple who wants to be a part of it can be a part of it. And, and so uh, as, as the fall comes near, uh, start keep your eye out in July and August. We'll be having sign-ups again for Grace Marriage, and it, it can hugely benefit applying what we've been talking about this morning. In both of these commands, the Lord is driving out our self-centeredness, whether by following or by leading. And if you are not getting any satisfaction from obeying God in this area, you will not get any satisfaction from disobeying Him and avoiding what He is calling us to in this. Following is hard, and so is self-sacrificial servant leadership. And as one point of application for the couples, maybe... Maybe start canceling some of the streaming subscriptions and get a little bit more creative. Go out, do some things. Love one another intensely and, and intentionally. For God's glory, for your good, and for the good of those around us.